Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms of high profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Rutter. I'm currently a defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles and previously an LA County prosecutor for nearly a decade. We are recording this on Friday, August 19th, 2022. In this week's episode, we'll be discussing the legal ramifications of Anne Heche's tragic death following a fatal collision with a residence. We will also look uh, at the lawsuit filed by Kobe Bryant's widow for a crash site pictures allegedly shared by Los Angeles sheriff's deputies and firefighters. Next, the FBI releasing evidence that Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger, causing an onset death in the Rust shooting. And finally, we will look at the FBI raid on Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate and about the former president invoking the Fifth Amendment in a deposition days later. Today, we are joined by Robert Simon, a trial attorney specializing in civil law, co-founder of the Simon Law Group, legal analyst, podcaster, and friend of the show. Welcome, Bob. Hey, man, thanks for having me on. We got a very interesting lineup today, Josh. What a busy week. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on these cases. Uh, before we jump in, though, I, you have some big news to share. Actually, a couple of big things. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what's going on? Yeah, so I wa- welcomed my third daughter into this world uh, last Monday. So this is recorded it was 11 days ago when this is recorded. So Congratulations. Girl dad, uh, girl dad times three. You know, we're going to talk about Kobe Bryant, who's the ultimate girl dad, right? <laughs> right. And then, you know, I have another company that I found called Justice HQ, and we just opened a San Diego location yesterday. So a lot of, you know, professionally, socially, you know, what do you call it when it's just you at home? I don't know what they call it. Something all the <laughs> doing, doing well, man. Sorry, do you get lack of sleep? After you you, you got it. a lot of spinning plates, so we get it. We understand. <laughs> um, all right. Well, let's jump in. First, we're talking about uh, something right here in Los Angeles, California. After a horrific car accident, the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner Coroner ruled Anne Heche died due to inhalation of smoke and thermal injuries. These injuries stemmed from an August 5th accident when Heche, 53 years old at the time, crashed her Mini Cooper into a Los Angeles home. Both her car and the house caught fire. The LA Fire Department press release uh, stated it took 59 firefighters around 65 minutes to extinguish the flames and extract the driver. The actress remained in a coma for over a week after the crash before it was announced that she would be taken off of life support. The incident was being investigated as a felon DUI collision by LAPD prior to Heche being pronounced legally dead. And most recently, the coroner ruled that her her death as an accident. Um, So, Bob, walk us through what, if any, civil liability still exists for Heche and her estate? How does that work after a person's died? Yeah, I mean, I handle a lot of cases just like this where the the person that did the harm died in the crash or dies thereafter. So you're the debt. So, I mean, she's dead, right? I mean, she's not going to be able to personally pay a debt. However, her estate uh, will have to pay any debts that are owed. So what's going to have to happen is the the plaintiffs, the claimants for the property damage and all the damage that she claimed that that she caused, um, they're going to have to you know file a claim first and then maybe even a lawsuit to be like a debtor of the estate. Sometimes what you have to do as a lawyer when we're on that side is we have to like go make it upon ourselves to go open up, create an estate and open it up for them. And oh, who wow. knows what her state of affairs are actually in because you know there's different levels of debtors that have to be taken care of out of the estate. Uh, but that's first and foremost. These people are gonna have to tabulate their damages. Likely they have their own insurance um, as their own property owners, right? And they will have their own insurance will likely pay for all this stuff up front and then seek what's called subrogation or go against the insurance company for Miss Hayes to pay. And if they refuse to, or the homeowners don't have enough insurance or no insurance, they will have to go after her estate to do it that way. So no, her estate is not off the hook. You know, it's just gonna, it's gonna be a debt. And I think the best thing that can be done is the people that will be controlling the estate now just kind of step up and try to take care of it. Cause I think you wanna get as much bad press away as much as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, and they were all talking about, you know, all the, you know, the drugs, the alcohol, these types of things. And anybody that knows anybody suffering from addiction, it is, it's an illness, right? It's, it's something that you have to be aware of and something you, people, we people like this in our lives. So you have to really concentrate on these types of things, but it's not going to really matter if she was or was not on drugs at the time or alcohol. That's, that's yeah. what I was going to ask you. Does that play any role or is it just, hey, she hit this building? I mean, yeah. thank God nobody else inside died. But all we're talking about is, hey, you hit a building. You, you shouldn't have done that. And you 
you you're responsible to pay for it is that all, all that it comes down to yeah and you're covered you know coverage most auto insurance coverages you know they'll cover you even if you're you're driving while intoxicated and you hit somebody else unless unless she's had multiple prior duis and there was a specific exclusion like if they say hey you're a bad player in this we know that you're not going to be able like you're likely to make this cause they're going to raise your premiums and say we're not going to cover it if you're drunk that happens i've seen like second or third dui people have very high policies that specifically exclude if they're intoxicated when they drive now that's not that's not you know there might also be something else at play because we don't know the circumstances leading up to what right. happened to, to miss Hayes. Right. So, you know is there somebody else that may be at fault like we see a lot of i, I had seen it earlier i don't know if it ever panned out but you know fentanyl is always mentioned like every right. day over every social media platform right. right um and a lot of times that comes whenever you're buying street drugs or illegal things that are, are mixed up with it and you do not know yeah. so well dude weed is legal in california what if she went to a weed right. shop and she accidentally bought a product right. or a brand that had fentanyl in it maybe she right. had a claim for that but you know it's it just a mess but then the coroner says it's an accidental death because i don't think she intentionally meant to run her car and cause fire and breathe inhalation yeah but yeah, um, there's that. So. Yeah. I, w- one point on that that I thought was interesting is usually what the coroner is essentially saying is that she didn't do this on purpose. So in other words, this wasn't a suicide attempt, which it's fairly early for them to have determined that because usually they go about interviewing everybody that was with her that day, the people that she lives with. They go through perhaps her phone, her search history. Was she searching for, you know, suicide hotlines and things like that? So either they did all that very quickly or this seems like a rather premature kind of determination I, who knows if it will end up being here or there but um as you were speaking something else i thought was interesting is what i mean and this is again total hypothetical world we're dealing with here but yeah. what if she was at some other celebrity's home when she had the cocaine and the cocaine was laced with fentanyl are are they looking at some liability now that she went out high as a kite and crashed into some house the lawyer answer we always hear, right, John? It depends. <laughs> it depends. So we, there's a law that's a lot of the states, including California, called dram shop law. So if she's at a bar overserved, or if she went somewhere and's overserved, they kind of cut off liability unless it's extreme or they know or should have known that she was a danger going out there, right? So it could be, you know, if this mm. were a case where there was significant, significant property damages would not be able to be covered or injury she caused to other people. I mean, he's still right. heavily unturned, you know, and if if somebody had promised her, for instance, that she's at this party, you know, doing day drugs or whatever the heck is going on right, right. Right in these areas, you know, if she's doing these things and they're like, oh, we guarantee you it's safe. We went to some holistic place and blah, blah, blah. And then it ends up being laced with fentanyl and maybe they knew about it and just wanted to see how she'd react. Who knows, man? Like this is a it's a hypothetical, but who who knows what goes on? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I agree. If there if thank God there wasn't. But if there was more serious injuries involved to other people, you would imagine, like you said, no stone left unturned and they would find out where she got those drugs from. That's right. All right, let's stick with another case, another tragic case here out of Los Angeles. Vanessa Bryant and Chris Chester are suing LA County after deputy sheriffs and firefighters allegedly took and shared photographs of their loved one's remains. Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna, and other parents and players were flying to a girls' basketball tournament when their chartered helicopter crashed. This is one of those things, Bob, that I think everybody knows where they were when they heard about this. Like, I I will never forget the moment I got a call from a friend while I was driving to tell me that Kobe had died. Uh, The lawsuit alleges invasion of privacy, claiming deputies took the photos for non-investigative purposes and shared them off-duty. It further alleges that the plaintiffs suffered emotional distress because of the photos. The county already settled a similar case brought by families of crash victims reportedly for around $2.5 million. A law prompted by the crash makes it a crime for first responders to take unauthorized photos of deceased people at the scene of the accident. Uh, Bob, a lot of listeners... I imagine are asking how can taking photos result in such large damages like we saw in that previous case two and a half million who knows what comes out of this case walk us through that what is the theory behind that so i mean you have i mean it's an emotional distress claim at its core for vanessa bryant her children the other plaintiff that sued because put it this way like if you imagine have going to a place where you have shielded your children and yourself from seeing these graphic photos of your loved one that died. I mean, just think about that for a second. Yeah. What that would be like if you saw those photos. 
And like when I when I do, I do a lot of wrongful death cases, and and I personally hate looking at those photos. You cannot not see that. A lot yeah. of times I don't look at them. I go through trial, and what I'll do sometimes is I'll just put it in an envelope, and I'll tell the jury, "Look, I didn't want to put you through this. I didn't want the family to see these photos. Here's an exhibit. It's going to go back there with you. You can look at it if you want. You can look at it if you want to look at it. That's not what I. We're not here to pull your heartstrings. These things like this." But imagine what their family would have to go through if they start seeing on the internet. And you know how it goes. I mean, this would be published everywhere. I mean, and then they'd have to go through everything with their daughters. And this is where, this is where I think the defense is, they're screwing up royally. If anybody's following this trial is they're trying to put at issue her her psychological condition because it's her emotional distress claim, fine. But they want to go into and start showing, they're asking the judge in a federal court in Los Angeles they want to show pictures of her on vacation afterwards. Oh wow! They want to they want to show pictures of her dressed as Cruella Deville for Halloween, because she because revenge is one of the um, like signs of grief, or one of the steps of grief. I kid you not. If they do so, that, Josh, I, if I was on that side, if I were the plaintiff's lawyer, I'd be like, go for it. So go. they're 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 essentially trying to say that she's falsely uh, 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 mourning the death of Kobe. Is that what this, is that the argument here? Yeah, how, I mean, I see this a lot, my how could she possibly be having so much fun? Right. I mean, she should be grieving. Right. I'm telling you, it is a mistake. And juries, wow. that, it backfires. Um, it's a mistake. Now, the thing that they should just own up to it, because look, one of the causes of action is straight up negligence. The other one's right. privacy. And all all roads lead to Rome. You could win on negligence. You could win on privacy invasion. All of these go to damages. They go to money right. damages for Vanessa Bryant. They have admitted they took the photos. They are on video sharing them in a bar and laughing about it. God. Yeah. So you're done. Yeah. You should go up there and say, and they did do, they did damage control. They said they deleted them. They can't find them anywhere. If you go on the internet, they're not there now. Now here's the kicker. What if it starts surfacing? What if somebody goes into the dark web and gets paid a lot of money for the photo right. that's out there? Right. They'll put a plug in it for this litigation because they're trying to minimize damages but there's nothing stopping that from happening right no that's the fear and if you look at other similar cases there was aaron andrews has happened a friend of mine tried this case it was in nashville maybe four or five years ago um she was filmed through a peephole in her hotel oh yeah yeah oh yeah and i think that was something like a 40 plus million dollar verdict Wow. And just you know, seeing the little the silhouette through the keyhole, um, and it was in a more conservative venue than by far Los Angeles, and they held the hotel accountable for fifty wow. percent over the person that took the photos. Now here, it's like these people are employed and stuff, so it's all going to come from LA County and stuff like that. But man, it's bad for them. And this case is just about money damages, in my opinion. Um, this is what they should have selected the jury on. My only questions would be: Are you able to compensate somebody tens of millions of dollars? for invasion of privacy or for somebody that would have to repeatedly have their daughter shown photographs of their dead father, of their dead sibling. That yeah, is, w- that would be the only thing I'd be talking about. And so I, I was just going to ask you that. So I know you're a plaintiff's attorney yep. and I know as painful as this may be for you, if you could put on your defense attorney hat for just a second, what, what, how do you defend this? I, I, my kind of rookie attitude was, well, maybe you say, listen, the grief that they're experiencing is very real and the emotional damage is very real, but that's about the deaths of their loved ones. That's not about a couple of photographs that may have been taken. Is that an argument you even get close to? Or is this, like you yeah. said, you don't touch it and you just try to mitigate the damages? Yeah. So I think you do try to mitigate the damages to some degree. If I'm on the other side, which I never am, by the way, but I, when I do these focus groups, I always play the defense lawyer because I know how I would beat my own case. And I try to right. do it just to see what would happen. Um, I would begin there talking to the jury about my my themes would be, you know, kind of the punishment has to fit the crime. Right. This is this is what happened. We did what we could. We deleted all the things when it happened. There's a few bad apples that did things. They're remorseful about it. It's not going to happen again. Um, she's due a significant amount of money. We think that, you know, a million for her and a million for the kids is, is fair compensation. You know, that's, that's not let this get out of control or proportion, you know, understand she's the high profile person. This is how I would be framing this case. And the most successful lawyers that I see on the other side do this, they kind of fall on their sword. They become very apologetic and they just minimize stuff. Yeah. Juries these days, we see a lot of things we call nuclear verdicts. I've had a few recently myself. And the reason is because jurors are ticked off. 
And if you yeah. start doing things to tick them off, like what they're talking about, showing her on vacation and trying to minimize her grief or say that she's dressed as Cruella, Cruella DeVille, you're going to get you will get hit by a 10 million plus dollar verdict, in my opinion. Al, Al, Alex Jones. Exactly. Now, that was, you know, four million plus 40 punitives. It's going to get knocked down because of Texas. But right. Uh, but yeah, it, but, a but I think it was the jury punishing this man for his for his behavior. Right. Yep find your villain right and if you get those jurors ticked off about that villain could be anybody in the court could be one of the lawyers could be one of the players could be one of the defense experts could be you better not be your client it better not be you as the lawyer right now the defense in this case in my opinion are doing a good job of making themselves look like the villain for picking yeah. on this woman rather yeah. than accepting responsibility yeah very bizarre strategy uh, um are you are you surprised at all that th there was a previous case that settled for in the millions are you surprised that this one's going to trial or why, why do, what are your thoughts on why this one didn't settle so the it's always up to the individual to settle it's never the lawyer's call but anyway they they settled that lawsuit confidential amount but it is significant um so now we you, we dovetail into this and i think with what we see around a lot of celebrities and the overreaching of years of the paparazzi and all these things happening, I think lawsuits are the number one thing that can deter bad behavior, whether it's a pharmaceutical company, whether it's a bad car manufacturer, or whether it's somebody that's trying to lead, you know, have take a bad celebrity moment or somebody's bad private life and try to profit off of it or to make fun of it. We see this on social media and things. And the more that we hold people accountable in the public forum, the more it curbs behavior. Now, there's nothing stopping her right now. You can settle the lawsuit at any time. Yeah, they could do it today. They could do it tomorrow. They could do it during jury selection. So I think that the more press they get out to show, they, they've already had these people go up on the stand. You've, you've proven your point. They're up there admitting right. to what had happened. You've, you've done it. Now, if you can get them to a point the more the the longer this trial goes on, the better it's going to be for for um, the plaintiffs in this case, as far as leverage for a monetary amount. And if they compensate the past couple of clients for two and a half, you know that that's the bare minimum offer that they've given them as well. So, hmm. yeah, I think I don't know why they would want it to go go to the jury proves a point, um, but you could have a jury say if if you're if you're trying the case as the defense lawyer is how I would, a jury may say you know what. A couple million bucks is a lot of money they could put into a trust for the kids think in the back of their head they've been compensated let's do that yeah. it's just a matter of where where the dollars are at this point so yeah interesting when we're airing this i think uh, vanessa bryant takes the stand today um, oh wow yeah so that's usually you'll get the gauge of as a plaintiff lawyer you that we kind of call that our money moment to see how they're presenting and are they connecting with your audience that's going to say your comp your compensation here in federal court, it's eight jurors. It's got to be unanimous. So you can see how they're reacting in live time. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And we, I have close friends that are close friends with um, the Bryants and everybody praises how amazing she is. And if that comes off on the stand um, and if the defense goes in and does these things that are, yeah, take a jury off. Whew, God, do you imagine trying to cross, cross examine the widow of Hobie Bryant and try to make it sound like she's playing up her grief yeah. good grief the best lawyers i've seen that are that minimize these they don't ask a single question yeah. yeah yeah that would be a smart move another case that we've been following uh for a while now out of santa fe new mexico um according to an fbi forensic report the gun used in the fatal shooting on the rust movie set could not have been fired without pulling the trigger. In previous interviews, Alec Baldwin said that he didn't pull the trigger on the gun. He's, he was quoted in an interview, interview as saying, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. Pretty, pretty clear on that. The discharge firearm caused the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins, 42 years old, in October of 2021. Now, the armorer of the production, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, has slammed local authorities investigating the case for their investigation. Reed's lawyer has stated the primary question in this case from the beginning has been where did the live rounds that ended up on the Rust set come from? Reed and her legal team allege that sher the sheriff's office did not ask the FBI to conduct testing on the ammunition rounds for fingerprints or DNA. All right. This is an interesting development. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a shock to anyone who knows anything about firearms, but the, the FBI has now said someone pulled the trigger. The trigger was pulled for that gun to have gone off. How does this finding change the outlook for Baldwin on as far as a civil lawsuit? 
or here in the civil lawsuit, anything you say can will be held against you in the court because <laughs> yeah, you're at any time, like it's one of the evidence exceptions. So unfortunately for Mr. Baldwin is he's just got caught lying. Yeah. You know, the FBI comes in, they're going to say, look, they have, they haven't matched up, you know, in a, in a very hypothetical world. So this is, this is a revolver. So there, you know, it's a very long stretch, but you could pull the truck, you could pull the trigger, but cock the hammer back, holding it with just your thumb, right? Because right. it's a revolver. And if you let loose with the hammer, it might go all the way through and strike the rounds and cause the discharge. Um, you know, but even but, then, you're pulling the trigger. Right, right? I was going to say, but the yeah. first part of that whole scenario is pull the trigger. Well, <laughs> well, this is, I mean, the way I say that, it's like maybe, maybe that's what, if I'm, I, you're going to damage control now in this case if you're without, because yeah. he lied about it. So why didn't you, I just cock the hammer maybe you didn't remember pulling the trigger and it just, whatever. Right, right, right. right. So <laughs> end of the day, he's also part of the production company. They're the ones in the insurance on the hook. We talked about this last time is if they want to pursue any type of punitive damage, he's personally going to be looked at and they're going to rifle through his finances. And I think the biggest thing that came out of this to know uh, they're going to be held civilly liable because it's a negligent standard. It's more likely true than not true. I mean, right. this person, like it happened, right? Um, this is going to come from the same insurance pockets, I believe, in the back end. This is just going to come into he's a he's a liar. He's yeah. He got caught lying by the FBI, right? This is this is silly. Um, I don't think it's going to matter too much for that lawsuit, but I do somewhat agree um, with the person that you just mentioned. Is it does there is maybe culpability on who loaded the live ammunition into yeah. the? I, I was going to ask you about that. If that's true, I mean, I I would be shocked in a case like this. I mean. They've been investigating it for months, right? In a case like this, I can't imagine that they wouldn't have dusted the 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 round, you know, because it would have remained in the chamber, right, on a revolver. So they could know exactly which round it was, dusted that, DNA'd all of that to determine who was the last person to have touched that bullet before it went into the gun, because that's a huge question, right? If you're Baldwin, you're saying, I thought I was handed, the gun wasn't hot, right? That's his whole thing. Yep. So who put that live round in there? If that is in fact true that they don't know and they never tested it, does that does that work for him? Or how? I mean, does that give him any advantage on the civil case? Or how does that work? It just puts in another defendant that may be able to financially contribute. So who would be responsible for loading the round? Is it the same production company? So it's not going to matter. Right. They have a third party person that was supposed to do it. Or are they covered by some other insurer? Would be another defendant. Because again, he's also contributing to, because he's the one that pulled the trigger, or caught the hammer, whatever you want right. to say, he's going to be at least a percentage at fault, even if there was a third party to put a live round into it, he didn't know, right? right? I mean, that's just the way that it works. So I just, I would be shocked like you if they didn't try to figure that out, you know, who put it in, if they went to as far as to see if the trigger was pulled, why not just dust right. the Right. Bullets, We're also dealing with the FBI here. It's not like they are, are low on resources. I yeah. mean, they, they kind of do everything. Yeah. And I don't know. I just another one that I really think that they're they're up Blanks Creek on this one. Yeah. Uh, and we talked about like, I know the lawyers that are on this case for the plaintiff and <laughs> they're not going to leave any stone uncovered, man. I mean, right. it's bad news. So. So. Again, talking about how long this investigation has been taken, the, the, the sheriff's department has apparently still not presented their, their file to the DA for any kind of filing decision on criminal charges. So tell me, how would that change things from a civil perspective? Let's say he, let's say in the scenario of they don't file on them and in the scenario of they do file charges on them, even if those charges are some sort of negligent discharge and not murder, right? Yeah, so, so civilly, it's not really going to matter other so but if there if there's criminal proceedings that happen it will stay or pause the civil lawsuit the side for money damages until that criminal one is wrapped up most of the time that's what happens if right. there is say he gets charged with something and there's a plea for a misdemeanor or something which you would know better than than i where these charges may lie where it may go um but in the civil side the only thing that would you'd be able to use as evidence is if he was if he pled to a felony or if he was convicted of a felony, then it would be like automatic, you are at fault pretty much for the gotcha. civil. Gotcha. Otherwise, it doesn't, you still prove your case within a case. And again, it's it's a different standard of a burden of proof where it's more likely true than not true. So you just have to prove, did he, yeah, probably screw up? Did the production yeah. company, un, I mean, if they just put in live 
rounds by accident, that's like enough in the, in the civil right. lawsuit. In the criminal one, you gotta, you know, it's much different. You gotta be on a reasonable doubt. It's a much bigger burden of proof. So, no. yeah. But what do you well, think we, about that? I mean, what do you think? You think he's gonna get charged criminally on that? I, it, the problem here is his, is his intent, right? His mindset. It, it, it's obvious, I think, to everyone, he didn't intend to do this, but was his conduct so grossly negligent that you can kind of, you know, infer that that mindset upon him that he it is so grossly negligent to point a gun at someone and pull the trigger regardless if you know there's not live rounds or even if you believe it's empty. I mean, you ever been to a gun store? They fully empty the gun and show everyone that the gun's empty, but they will never ever point that gun at at someone even knowing that that gun is empty. So I, you know, is that so gross grossly negligent? That you could you could say that it equates to a criminal mindset. I don't know. I would have said earlier on that there, there's no way they do this, but they've been taking this investigation for so long that it makes me wonder: Are yeah. they over there wringing their hands because they know they're about to charge? You know, the biggest case they've ever had out of that small little county. I don't know. I it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Again, it's going into the mindset. Like it's known in the industry that these things can happen. And so, right. is, is it reckless, grossly, you know, negligence? Or, you know, is that manslaughter? Is that whatever? Right. I, don't think, I don't think it's going to rise to the level of of anything else above that because I, I don't. I, think I think it would be a really difficult case to, to prove that. I mean, you know, if, there, if, if he had alcohol in his system, maybe we'd be talking something different. But if everything remains as we know right now, I would be shocked if they charge him. But we'll see. I mean, they're taking a long time to investigate this. So uh, we'll see. Maybe he just has All right. A Say Beetlejuice three times and it'll come help. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a great reference. Here's the big one. I, the one I know everybody's been waiting for. Uh, finally, out of West Palm Beach, Florida and New York, on August 8th, the FBI executed a search warrant and raid on former President Trump's West Palm Beach home. Federal agents seized 27 boxes, allegedly including 11 sets of classified documents that were labeled top secret, secret, or confidential. According to an unsealed portions of the warrant, the search was conducted as part of a federal probe into whether Trump illegally took classified material with him when he left the White House. Days later, Trump was to be deposed by lawyers from the New York Attorney General's office as part of a civil investigation alleging the Trump organization exaggerated the value of its holdings to impress lenders or misstated what land was worth to slash its tax burden. In an hours-long deposition, Trump reportedly took the fifth more than 400 times. Trump has previously been publicly critical of those who plead the fifth. In a final uh, stunning turn of events, a judge is poised to release parts of a key Mar-a-Lago raid document despite DOJ complaints an affidavit underpinning the search of Trump, Trump's estate will be made public. Federal prosecutors have been given until August 25th to submit a list of requested redactions. The government will be given an opportunity to appeal if it doesn't agree with the proposed redactions. All right, right off the bat, give us your thoughts on this raid, Bob, of, of a former sitting president. I mean, this is historical, yes? I mean, it's one of those, it's, it's, it's unprecedented, it's huge. And yeah. I mean, here's the thing, like, we just were talking about the FBI. I know a lot of people in the FBI. These are some of the most upstanding people that are just trying to get to the truth. They don't, most people, they don't have a political agenda, right? Right. But if you're doing something like this, you better sure as heck have some big thing at the end of the, yeah. at the end yeah. of the rainbow. And yeah. it better not just be a few rink and ding documents that should be in the National Archives. It better not be. Or else this is just a monumental egg on your face, right? Yeah. Again, we're dealing in the unknown right now. We talked about like if they release this affidavit, and it turned if they show just the name of the person that gave the information, maybe that might be a clue or two. But again, we're we're operating in unknown here. But if it is truly something that's like big at the end of the rainbow, then it's justified. But if it's something small, it's going to look real dumb. Oh yeah, I, I, the the second I heard about it, my thought was they there better be a dead body at the end of the rainbow. I mean, this is so <laughs> huge that they. You know, there, there must have been, but then it's like they've been, they've known he's had these boxes for months. They've been going back and forth about, you know, there's emails from the FBI saying we want that room secured. So it's not like 
they were hidden and and Trump was lying about where they were or what they were. It, it's just if this is really just all about you know documents that belong in archives, I agree with agree with you. This they totally missed the mark on mm -hmm. how they played this thing out to execute an actual warrant. So if they had. I think they had given them the chance several times saying, hey, we know you have some of these in your possession, return, return, return. They returned right. some and it's like, well, we know, return, return, return. Then in June, their lawyer says, we don't have them. Well, we know if that's, if that, I've, I've read that a few times. If that's true, yeah. we didn't have them. That's kind of messed up. So I think that's yeah. where the, David comes in where somebody's saying, hey, this is still here. But if they, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you deal with this a lot. If they say, yes, it's here, there has to be some like, imminent threat that something bad is going to happen with those documents that are there right like it can't right. just for them to do what they did it had to have been like this is here and this is going to go somewhere else or somebody's coming over to look at this that shouldn't have their eyes on it has to be something serious because you deal with this a lot more than i do i mean what are your thoughts on that i i think that if it was a dispute like you said that they they were asking for the documents he he's he, him and his team are saying we don't have to give them back back and forth all of that I think a smarter kind of political from a political perspective way to done it would just go in front of a judge make a motion to compel in front of a judge say listen there's a dispute over these documents we don't believe he should have them we want you to rule them to and i think that would have played out a lot better than you know a bunch of armed agents showing up at his house and rifling through his stuff especially to dealing with the person that you're dealing with trump has putting it mildly embraced the idea of being a martyr right and doesn't this just perfectly play into all of that especially if at the end of the day what you come up with is bupkis well i i've thought when i first heard about this i thought look say what you want about trump i'm personally not a fan of the guy but he's smart to the point of like did he did he orchestrate i thought in my head I was like if he orchestrated all of this just to embarrass <laughs> The current administration, like set it up to pre pretend like he had all these documents and somebody submitted an affidavit that he kind of knew about. And if it's right. not the end of the rainbow, oh right. boy, oh right. boy, give the man credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Um, all right, let's um, let's switch gears a little bit to talk about him pleading the fifth because th these two things took place so close in time that everybody kind of thought there was some sort of connection. And I, I think there is in a way, and I'll explain, but. Um, he took the fifth in a civil deposition. Talk to us about that. Have you have you handled that before? How do you handle it? What are the ramifications of it? Yeah, so anytime, same type of thing. If there's an underlying crime that like we talk about, the Anheshta that came to the present in a civil lawsuit. So right. somebody's driving drunk, kills somebody. There's a criminal aspect to it. That person's going to plead the fifth not to incriminate themselves during the civil lawsuit. Two different paths, right? So I've had that many times. You know, I had one where I was trying a case up in Santa Cruz and I had a very high profile man run over a migrant worker and kill him, try to flee. He had pled the fifth all the way through the civil lawsuit, even though they didn't pursue charges until like the day of civil trial. And he's like, oh, why? Now I want to testify. I want to talk about it. I mean, it was it was like it was crazy. But, you know, we had to retake his deposition, do all these other things. But in the civil lawsuits. It, it, it's not like the criminal where you can't use it against them that they didn't testify in civil it's you can you get an adverse like instruction a lot of the times that say they didn't testify and as a lawyer i go up there and say because you know what they probably say yeah right? i was going to say how i know that you're allowed to use that what, they call it like a negative inference or something that you're allowed to take away explain to us what that means like how does that play out in court yeah so let's like um there's jury instructions and and some of them will say like if you didn't hear from a witness and if you think that would have been unfavorable for them, you can infer that it would that 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 their silence was like not good for them, right? Because interesting, it, yeah. yeah the, your instructions are different per per state and whatever. But be that as it may, what what that means is that if if Trump continues to plead the fifth all the way through and through trial in a case like this, a jury can a, a prosecutor go up and say, or you know, a plaintiff lawyer can say he's pleading the fifth because he knows he's he's guilty. You can hold, you know, you can take that inference. Is his silence means that what he has to say is bad. Wow. Um, but you, again, play this out. Like if there are no criminal charges or whatever, and he can he can come back and say, I'm now gonna want to testify. You know, I've seen this happen before. This could just be a timing issue. And, and right now, look, his home just gets raided in West Palm Beach. 
Yeah. If you were his attorney, would you tell him to plead the that, fifth right? Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Everybody's making such a big deal out of it. I don't think there's a criminal defense attorney around who would let their client go under oath for anything when it's obvious that they're under some sort of huge criminal investigation. Until we get to the bottom of what that was all about, I wouldn't let him testify to anything uh, at deposition or at trial or anywhere. I mean, the other point that people are making is, oh, he, he pled the fifth 400 times. I mean, I'm not trying to take away from the significance of him pleading the fifth. But what that is, is, you know, uh, you know, it's a civil defense attorney or a civil plaintiff's attorney, uh, in case, this case, the AG. But they're just asking him every question they would have asked him. And he's saying the same answer to every single one of them so that they can get those answers out there if they want to use them later on. So it's, yeah. it, it's again, not so shocking that he did it that many times when you understand you know, a, what's happening here. As a plaintiff lawyer, you know, I'm going to ask a lot of questions at a deposition that I know is going to get objected to and not answer, but you're doing it for a different purpose. Sometimes it's to educate the other person on what's going on in the background or to show your hand a little bit to show how the strength of your case and or to you know, have a media position <laughs> in this one. I mean, you can be they, they might have been asking questions like, uh, Mr. Trump, isn't it true that you had uh, nuclear documents? Um, right, right, right. The toilets for the Saudis in your in your septic system. Is that true? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, they could have not had anything right. to do with the, that with that case whatsoever and been asking in this. Right. So. Right. So funny. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. It, again, to me, is kind of shocking. The judge has said that he intends to unseal the affidavit to the warrant. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about that. What has been released to the public right now is the um, the warrant itself, which is basically an, a judge saying that based upon evidence that I've seen, you know, certain there there is evidence of perhaps the commission of certain crimes, and that's when everybody kind of, you know, lost their brains about the Espionage Act was listed amongst those things, mm -hmm. and then um, it gave the receipt, uh, meaning what documents were actually taken, and it's kind of a general description of you know twenty seven boxes. Some of the boxes contain such and such materials. But the real important part of a warrant is the affidavit. And yep. that's where all the information is contained that talks about how, how did they get this evidence that they then show to the judge. And in an ongoing investigation, usually the government in, enjoys almost unpenetrable protection from anything like that. And here the judges, I want to get your thoughts on it. I have some thoughts, but here the judges decided to go ahead and release that it with redactions, but go ahead and release that. What are your thoughts? Well, I think and also recently they went up to the Court of Appeal and they said, no, it's OK to release it. So now you've had two courts be able who said the same thing. Yeah. And again, they're reviewing. I would assume that these judges are have reviewed the affidavit in camera, which means the judge reviews it by themselves and knows right. the contents of it before making these rulings. Which leads me to believe there's some. I mean, that they don't that they think maybe there's some bigger look. You, I mean, judge they may be thinking this way that there's been so much violence directed towards the FBI and federal agents right now that maybe they need to get this out there for the public safety or for the safety of the FBI. Like these are things that they can think about when they're releasing yeah. that affidavit. But in my opinion, it's crucial because whoever, from what I've heard, whoever knew where all these things were and where his safe was would have to be very close to to his circle. Sure. So the person who signed it, if they released nothing else, but the person who gave them that information, that might be enough to give the public a little bit more ease or ease the pressure off the FBI. Who knows, right? I, I, I think what's funny is I think what they'll actually redact is the name of that person. Really? I think we'll probably I mean, get that's it. all I want to know. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Wanna... I think that that person will be identified as a confidential informant and they probably won't won't tell us now maybe there will be enough information surrounding that that we'll have we could you know figure out the identity of that person but <laughs> I, I think that's probably the only thing we won't know my my thought was it, it, you're absolutely right a judge took this in camera reviewed it decided whether or not there's you know this incredible public interest in this and there's all these other kind of policy reasons why they should probably release it including uh you know there's no privacy problems because Trump is out there saying, I want it released. Um, and he's saying he declassified him, right? Right, so. right. What I think is that whatever's in the affidavit is apparently not something that will jeopardize a continuing investigation. So the judge feels like this won't harm you in whatever investigation you're conducting. It's either that or this is it. All this was about was the documents that they wanted returned to the White House 
And so there's nothing more in this affidavit about any other kind of continuing investigation. In other words, this is the end of the investigation. So there's no harm to the investigation by releasing this. Those those were my thoughts about this. Yeah. And I think with this, the second one that you brought up, the lawyer, I mean, the government lawyers have come out and been saying that this is an ongoing thing, right? That's been right. their reasoning. And I think they're, they're going to further brief that they'll have to show their hand a little bit. I mean, if the case is done and they got back what they got back and that's it, I mean, a lot of egg on people's faces. Yeah. This is a big yeah. nothing burger. Yeah, it is. Again, we don't know the contents, but whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it's a nothing burger. I agree with you. But the the there has been an argument. Well, listen, if these weren't declassified and he moved them, that can be a crime in and of itself. And then there's all this talk about, can he, would this you know, prevent him from running again? And I don't know if we want to get into the weeds on all of that. My, the, the only point being the constitution is the only document that can say what qualifies you for the presidency. So I imagine if they did try to dis disqualify him, it would be something the Supreme Court would have to decide. But the question I had and the thought I had was, Trump has made the argument that and it's true, as a sitting president, he can dis declassify anything at any time for whatever reason he wants. And he's made the argument that by moving these documents down to Mar-a-Lago, that in and of itself declassified them, and therefore none of this is me moving classified documents. Um, putting aside whether or not that would actually work and if, if he could do that, if these are now in fact declassified documents, my question is, would they be subject to a Freedom of Information <laughs> Act request? And how would that all play out? What are your thoughts yeah, on that, Bob? I think it would be, you could just make, you know, the Atlantic could just make a public record request to get them all. <laughs> exactly. So tomorrow, I'll go pick them up like it was his public library, it was presidential right. library. Look, and I, I just think, you know, in his mind, does he think these things? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. But there's a process when you declassify materials and you have to go through, you just have to say, well, you're president or whatever. Maybe yeah. maybe it didn't, but there's a pretty good, easy way to find out. But at first, he didn't have the documents. And then he says, well, I did, but I declassified them. And, you know, it's just the the confusion machine. He's a good yeah. guy. Most people yeah. are on both sides of the political spectrum do these types of things. And you just have to see through it and see what the actual evidence is and, and what happened. But, you know, if he declassified them, <laughs> again, Go ahead, go, go, Josh, go make a request. Go take a look. I know. Seriously, <laughs> I, I, I would love to know what they are, because why is he, why is there all this fighting over this stuff? I mean, people are like, oh, it's nuclear secrets. I don't think we have nuclear yeah. secrets printed out on documents. Quite frankly, we have things called computers, which are probably more dangerous to be in other people's hands. But whatever they are. He felt strongly about not giving them back to the to the White House, and they felt very strongly about going and getting them to the point of executing well, a search warrant on a on a former president i mean i would so, love to know what they are i mean so why didn't he just declassify stuff like i don't know hunter biden's laptop during the investigation <laughs> i mean why didn't he declassify um epstein's list right right, like, right. all these things right. Maybe, maybe that's what he's got maybe area 51 he's i want area 51 declassified <laughs> he's got hillary's emails area 51 who really killed jfk he has exactly. all the voter fraud that's all sitting in mar-a-lago and he's He's declassified he's, it. He's right. sitting on all of it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hilarious. Look, if, if he uh, did that would that, be fantastic. Oh, <laughs> Evidence you know. of aliens are sitting in his basement at Mar-a-Lago. I love it. <laughs> oh, that would, be, that would actually be really fun. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bob, thank you so much for coming on this week. Where, oh, where can people find out more about you? I mean, you can go to my Instagram at Planet Fun Bob. You can go to my website, justiceteam.com and look me up. You know, Robert Simon attorney, just Google it, man. I'm pretty easy to hit up and then a DM me and I'll get back to you. Um, Fantastic. I'm always, always happy to come on, man. And I love rapping about this stuff because it's great mental gymnastics. And you yeah. know, these things change day by day, man. And uh, I just impress on everybody listening. Find your own truth. Do your own due diligence. Don't listen blindly what people tell you about stuff. Logic usually carries the day. Find out for yourself. Wise words. Uh, and I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. And please check out my new website at joshuaritter.com. And you can find our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. Sidebar.